Continuing our farm system previews, let's talk about the St. Louis Cardinals and how much their top prospects can improve their defense. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, award-winning baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're proudly part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Jace Medical. Get a Jace case to take care of yourself with a personal supply of five antibiotics that can treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. It's J-A-S-E medical.com. Okay, so looking at the St. Louis Cardinal system, uh, my immediate thought is it's not as deep as some of the other systems that we've talked about, right? But you can see how a lot of these players can both fit into the major league roster and can legitimately improve the major league roster right away and it's because your first two prospects your top two prospects are are two of the very few guys in the minor leagues that have an 80 grade tool for something so the first one shortstop Mason Wynn we saw him a little bit last year he batted 172 in his brief call up but the 2020 second rounder was initially looked at out of high school before the draft as a two-way player they stuck him at shortstop but he hasn't lost the pitcher quality arm. So 105 games in AAA last year, 288, 359, 474 for Mason Wynn, 18 home runs, 40 extra base hits, 44 walks to 83 strikeouts, 17 to 19 on stolen bases. That's obviously, that's good production. That's not the highlight. The highlight is, is the 80 grade arm. If you watched last year's Futures game, and I know a lot of the everydayers tuned into the Futures game, you saw him make an infield assist over 100 miles an hour. Just really irritated Justin Turner when he did it. But he, Mason Wynn legitimately has an 80 grade arm. And so because of that, he's able to be a like somewhere between, and honestly, it's a little bit tough here, but somewhere between a 60 and 70 grade defender. He, you wouldn't know from the stolen base numbers, but he's incredibly fast. He was in the 90th percentile in sprint speed in AAA. And then, you know, briefly in that major league call up, he was only, again, only 17 and 19 on stolen bases, but the speed is there. And the speed and the arm give him a lot of grace, right? The Mason wins hands, the actions at shortstop are honestly average. But when you can throw across the diamond at 100 miles an hour, you can make up for lost time on a transfer. And so as soon as he comes up, he'll immediately be able to improve the the defense in the middle infield. And it helps that offensively, he's not bad. The power isn't necessarily amazing. 90th percentile exit velocity was something like 102. The max was like 110. But what's really good is is he had an 88% zone contact. He's really good at making contact. A little bit of a smaller guy. I think he's 5'11", 180. The power isn't necessarily there, but he's not here for that. He can get on base. He's got good speed. And I think if you wanted to, you could get more stolen bases out of him. And he's going to give you very good defense because he's rangy. And again, he's got a cannon for an arm. I'm not ever going to say that a shortstop is as good as Angelton Simmons was defensively. But I can say that Mason Wynn has the strongest arm I have seen at shortstop since Angelton Simmons. He throws harder than Elliot La Cruz. He throws harder than O'Neill. He throw this is the hardest arm I have seen at shortstop in a long time. And so because of it, Mason Wynn can do a lot of things defensively that a lot of other guys can't do. And if he's your opening day shortstop, which I legitimately think he might be, again he immediately upgrades the defense because of how many balls he can get to. And just the fact that he can get to the ball, he still has the arm strength to get it to first base in time to make the play. Really high floor for Mason Wynn between the contact ability and the great defense. And the other guy that can immediately improve the defense whenever he comes up is outfielder Victor Scott. Fifth rounder in 2022 out of West Virginia. His 80 grade is on his speed. 
He's legitimately one of the fastest players in all of baseball. He last year, 132 games between high A and double A. So I'm not saying he's going to open up the year in center field. You're still going to see Tommy Edmond out there. But 303, 369, 425, nine home runs, 39 extra base hits for Victor Scott, including 10 triples, 46 walks to 97 strikeouts, and 94 for 108 on stolen bases. He stole 94 bags in the minors uh, last year alone. He is a very good hitter that uh, is, he is, he can make good contact. He's also comfortable bunting his way on if he needs to, especially against the lefty. The baseball write-up talked a lot about how, like how he's willing against the lefty to, to lay down a bunt. And they even had success rates of getting on base via the bunt and everything for Victor Scott. He's willing and able to bunt because one, again, the speed is phenomenal, but two, there's not a lot of power here, right? And so it's a really nice lefty swing. It's not like something where you look at Billy Hamilton and the question was, if you can make contact, then he can use his speed to get on base. Victor Scott can get on base. It's a good swing. Again, not a lot of power in the profile, but that's not what he's here for. And then because of that speed, his outfield defense is very good. I'm not going to say it's Pete Crow Armstrong good, right? That's still the 80 grade on defense in the outfield in the minors. But I would give Victor Scott a 70 grade because just like Mason Wynn's arm, that speed gives him a lot of grace if he does something wrong in the process of trying to trying to get to the ball. If it's a bad, if it's a bad read, a bad reaction even a bad route, that speed can bail you out a lot. And so something you saw when they was in a fall league was Victor Scott just running all around and going to get everything. And so when Victor Scott is ready to come up, and I don't know when that's going to be, again, he was in high A and double A last year. Uh, when he comes up, he will immediately take over in center field as probably a top five defensive center fielder on day one because the speed is so good that it gives him so many, it gives him so greater of a chance to make so many plays. And the read routes reactions are good, but it's just the speed is so pure and so great that it raises that floor as well for Victor Scott. Uh, third prospect in the system, there's a lot of conversation here. I went with right-hand pitcher Tink Hintz, 2022 second rounder out of high school. Got in 23 games between high A and double A last year. 23 starts. Four and six with a 4-3-1 ERA and 96 and a third innings. 99 strikeouts of 9.3 per nine to 34 walks, 3.2 per nine, and 12 home runs allowed. Throws a fastball, really good velocity on it. Can get up to, can touch 99, and it's a very flat vertical approach angle. He's not incredibly big. You think we say 6-1 or so, and, and so he comes in, it's around negative four degrees or so. Very flat and so because of that, it works well up in the zone when he can command it. It doesn't always have know exactly where it's going, but when he can command it, very effective up in the zone. He partners that with a hard slider, a changeup, and a vertical breaking curveball. Curveball's in the low 80s, changeup's in the low 80s, they're in the same velocity band, slider's in the mid 80s. Now, he didn't throw the curveball a ton last year from what I saw. It was something he threw it more in 2022. Then he threw it in 2023. I don't necessarily know how much of that was a deliberate decision and how much of that was a lack of faith in it or wanting to work on other things. But it does feel like he's throwing it harder now that he, he used to throw it in the 70s. And so when everything's working, you have the potential for four pitches here in three different velocity bands working in four different directions. It's a lot of the ingredients you need to have a top tier starting pitcher. A lot of the projections I've seen have been top half of the rotation. He feels like he's more of a three than a two to me. Some of that is listed at 6'1", 185. I have a little bit of concerns about the frame holding up. But either way, really high ceiling for Tink Hintz. And the model of what uh, St. Louis needs to find more of is pitchers with great stuff that can miss bats versus the old school St. Louis model of we're going to find pitchers who pitch to contact and you let our great defense go back behind them and clean it up because 
with the shift being gone, that's not as sustainable of an option unless you have amazing defenders. And the last couple of years, they haven't had amazing defenders in the infield. In just a minute, let's talk about some of the players you might see in 2024. A uh, couple position players, a couple pitchers. We'll get to all those guys next, right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Jace Medical. Uh, the FDA has talked about right now, we are seeing really odd uh, supply chain issues when it comes to medicines, right? I, there's been things about ADHD medicine. There was a thing recently about some different antibiotics like amoxicillin have been running low and some pharmacies are running out completely. And it's the worst flu season in a decade right now. And so that's why the Jace case is super useful. Even if you're not the type of person who doesn't go as world travelers or campers or all of that stuff, the Jace case is useful because it's a pack of five different antibiotics that can be used to treat a long list of bacterial infections, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, all kinds of stuff like that. Could happen to any of us. Go to jacemedical.com, complete your physician encounter. It gets reviewed by a board certified physician. Your medicines are dispensed by a licensed pharmacy and mailed to you at a fraction of what the regular cost would be if you went to your doctor for this. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com, use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. That's offer code locked on at Jace Medical, J A S E Medical.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors. They have everything you need to maintain your vehicle and keep it at peak performance. Maybe it's a supercharger, a rack, a roof rack, exhaust kits, LED headlights, speed, power style, doesn't matter. eBay Motors has you covered. They have over 122 million parts for your ride, so you will always find exactly what you are looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Okay, so looking at the St. Louis Cardinals system, and guys you may see in 2024, one of the guys that comes to mind is infielder Thomas J.C. He was part of the trade for Jordan Montgomery with the Texas Rangers. One of the returns here. And he, think of him, everydayers who have been watching the last couple weeks and have seen a lot of these farm previews, think of him like, I'm going to jokingly call him a diet version of Michael Bush, who was of the Dodgers, now of the Cubs. So 2022 fifth rounder out of high school, got 630 plate appearances between AA and AAA last year, batted 306, 374, 530, 26 home runs, 66 extra base hits, 52 walks to 144 strikeouts in 12 of 14 on stolen bases. The reason I'm calling him Diet Michael Bush is the power isn't at the level of Michael Bush, right? So, so JC's exit velocities, 90th percentile of 103. So it's not anything exceptional. It's not anything outstanding. But what he does a very good job about is getting getting optimal contact, right? Whether it's launch angle, sweet spot, he just crushes line drives all to all fields. Now, when you look at the contact numbers, you can see there's a little bit under the hood you've still got to work on. The overall contact number is 75.1%, but the zone contact is 90.7%. Because Thomas J.C. has a little bit of an issue at chasing sometimes. His chase is an above average 36.6%. And that's typically where a lot of his swings and misses come from. And he's good in the zone. Again, greater than 90% in the strike zone. But he's prone to chase some. That's why you see 144 strikeouts in 139 games. Right, just over 600 plate appearances. Is because of the chase. But he's going to make the most of his probably average power. He's going to be able to run high batting averages, uh, high on base percentages, and can probably give you 15 to 20 home runs, and I'd probably say 10 stolen bases at the major league level when he's finally up. Uh, now, defensively, last year he played some games. At, he played most of his games at second, 77 games at second. He played 40 at third. He played 13 at shortstop, and in a pinch, 
you could probably have him come in and cover shortstop for you for an inning or two after you, if you let him pinch hit or something, leave him in the game, cover shortstop. The arm is the limiting factor there. The athleticism's fine, it's not great, but the limiting factor is just what his arm can do, and that's why he's probably going to end up spending most of his time at second base. I can see a scenario where he is your second baseman and you have Nolan Gorman DHing and the amazing win at, at shortstop, you have significantly upgraded your middle infield defense. And then whenever Victor Scott does come up, you have upgraded your outfield defense as well. And all of a sudden now, you have some 80 grades running around in the field for you, cup playing defense, and you have a plus hitter in Sujaci as well, and you kept Gorman's power, but you have him at DH. A guy... Not sure when you're going to see him because there's a ton of outfielders in the system, but somebody I, I got to talk about, outfielder Moises Gomez. 2015 IFA by the Rays. He was taken by the Cardinals in the minor league portion of the Rule 5 draft a few years ago. And last year, 131 games in AAA, about 567 plate appearances. 232, 293, 457 slugging percentage. 30 home runs, 53 extra base hits. 39 walks to 180 strikeouts and five of six on stolen bases. While we're continuing the jokes of this guy is diet, that guy, Moises Gomez is diet Yasiel Puig. He's, uh, keep up the prospect thing, diet Andy Pajes of the Dodgers. Uh, the thing here, contact ability is where he's lacking. You saw the strikeouts, 64% contact in AAA, 72.8% in the zone. So there are some struggles there, but... His 90th percentile exit velocity is 105. He is one of two minor leaguers that hit 30 home runs in each of the last two seasons. So he's mostly a corner guy, 71 games in right, 27 in left. He played a couple games in center. And he's also DH'd quite a bit. So a lot of different options there. And you have a ton of outfielders in this system. So I don't know what happens with Moises Gomez, but he's an intri- he's a he's gonna be a lower batting average, higher strikeout guy that's going to be able to hit for power, but you're going to have to manage the situations because he's he's going to strike out too much. It's just interesting player, toolsy, but you've got issues that have not been resolved yet. Ryan pitcher Tokoa Roby is one of the other top pitching prospects in this system. 2022 th- uh, third rounder out of high school, and you saw him also come over from Texas, same time Sue JC did, and the thing here, 14 games in AA this year, 2-3 and three with a 4-6-3 ERA. All of these top pitching prospects put up four ERAs in the minors. Gordon Graceffo, Michael McGreevy, both put up four and changes in AAA last year. We'll get to them in a second. But Roby has the higher ceiling, I think, of all of these pitching prospects, maybe outside Tink Hens, right? 2-3 and three with a 4-6-3 ERA. It was a nice slash line over, nice stat line overall. 69 strikeouts, it's 10.6 per nine in his 58 and a third innings. 15 walks, 2.3 per nine, and only six home runs, so 0.9 per nine innings. The stuff here, fastball, sits mid-90s. He can run it up to 97 or so. He's got a vertical breaking curveball in the high 70s. He also has a gyro slider. He started using it a lot more this year than he was last year. Really good tunnel off of the fastball. Sits in the mid-80s, It identical halfway to the plate, and then it just drops. A good gyro slider does. Uh, also has a change up in the low 80s. And I think the thing that's holding Roby back right now is the change up and the slider are very clear and obvious third and fourth pitches from a frequency standpoint, from a confidence standpoint, and from a command standpoint. And the slider, the gyro slider, is used more than the change up is. But both of them are pitches he has to get more comfortable with. He has to be able to throw them to every batter not just the change up to a lefty, and he needs to be able to use them in more situations. It's just situational stuff now. The pitches themselves, other than some command issues with that slider and change up, the pitches look good. It's just getting comfortable with them. Graceffo and McGreevy. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them. You're going to see them this year. They spent most of last year, I think Graceffo was entirely in AAA, got 86 innings. McGreevy got 150 innings between AA and AAA. And again, they both had ear raise uh, in the fours. Graceffo was a 492. McGreevy was a 412. You look at their stuff here. Graceffo is 
fastball, mid to high 90s. The movement isn't exceptional. He has a gyro slider and a curveball. It's a good mix of stuff. I'd like to see him throw a changeup or just something that kind of moved the other moved the other direction from everything else a little bit more. McGreevy, four seam and a sinker. I really love the addition of the sinker for McGreevy. I think it unlocked a lot of stuff for him. Changeup, really good control of the changeup. His thing is he's just he doesn't walk a ton of guys, but he also doesn't strike out a ton of guys. He's pitching to contact. The sinker was really helped, but he's not blowing guys away with strikeouts. And so there is an inherent limitation to usually what a pitch to contact sinker changeup kind of guy can do at the major league level unless the velocity were to improve. And I just don't know at this point if it's going to or not. In just a minute, quite a few interesting lower level prospects to talk about. We've also got our dart throw. We'll talk about those guys next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. The NFL regular season is over. The first round of the playoffs is done. But there is still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. It's $150 in bonus bets. Win or lose, you don't have to pick the right team. You just have to pick a team. You can then take your bonus bets and go out. The MLB odds have been updated. St. Louis Cardinals, plus 3,000 to win the World Series. Looking at this division, it's going to be a really interesting divisional race. Cardinals have the best odds, plus 150. Cubs are second, Brewers are third, Reds are fourth. This is a four-way race, going to be very interesting all year to watch it. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet and get your 150 bucks in bonus bets with FanDuel, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Final segment of Locked On MLB Prospects here on Tuesday, talking about the St. Louis Cardinals farm system and want to get to four or five guys real quick and then give you our dart throw. So we're not going to go into as deep of scouting reports as we usually do and just know there's a ton of guys we want to talk about. We didn't have a chance to get to leave me a comment. If there's somebody you want to hear about, we'll throw them into Monday's mailbag. Outfielder Chase Davis, the first rounder out of Arizona in the most recent draft, had a questionable debut in the in 34 games in single A. Hit 212, no home runs, 25 walks to 34 strikeouts. And a couple questions you have going into his first full season in 2024. One, where is the hit tool going to be? It looked, again, in a small sample, Looked like he had a little bit of struggles with left-handed pitching. So I'm curious to see where that comes in. Where does the power come in with the conversion to wood? Again, he didn't hit any home runs in that 34-game sample in single A. Last year, he had a 90th percentile exit velocity in college of 108.2. So good power, but that's with the metal bat. So let's see. So we're curious about where the hit tool is going to end up and where the power tool is going to end up. And then I'm curious to see where he plays. Victor Scott is the future in center field, but Chase Davis has a plus arm. Can he stick in center or does he have to move to a corner? My prediction, and it was this coming out of the draft, was that he's eventually going to be a corner outfielder at the major league level. But where that power comes in, where that defense comes in, does absolutely matter as to his value going forward. We know this organization does a good job with outfield prospects, so I'm curious to see what happens to Chase Davis going forward. Two pitchers that I just really love talking about because I watched both of those pitchers in person the year they were drafted by St. Louis, left-hand pitcher Cooper Yerpe and right-hand pitcher Max Ragic. So Yerpe was the first rounder out of Oregon State, got in 10 games and high A, eight of those were starts before he had an elbow injury, missed most of the year, came back at the very end of the year for two appearances and went to the AFL. In the regular season, 2-3 and three with a 3-5-1 ERA in 41 innings with 51 strikeouts, 11.2 per 9 to 25 walks, 5.5 per 9, 8 home runs allowed, 1.8 per 9 innings. The thing about Cooper Yerpe is he, has a, he is a sidearm pitcher, and you just don't see... One, you don't see like you don't see lefty side armors. It feels like a ton, but you don't see side armor starting pitchers. And so the stuff plays up because of the deception it gets, 
but it's not typically what you would consider to be starter stuff. The fastball sits around 90 or 91. The slider's a sweeper in the high 70s. He's got a changeup. He's got a cutter. So can he continue to develop as a starter, or does he eventually get moved to the bullpen? Big question I've got there. And then right-hand pitcher Max Rajic was the sixth rounder in 22 out of UCLA. 23 games between A and high A went 9-6 and six with a 2.48 ERA and 123 and a third innings. Dead on 123 strikeouts, so 9 per 9 to 27 walks, 2 per 9, 6 home runs allowed. Four-seam fastball sits mid-90s, about 95 or so. Curveball and a slider. The curveball isn't as dominant so far in the minors as it was in college, and it feels like the slider actually gets more swings and misses than the curveball did. I want to see Max Rajic get the confidence back in that curveball and specifically what he's trying to do with that curveball. Because he's a very talented player, as you can see, 123 plus innings, he can take the ball. I just want to see this work out. I want to see this stuff get where it can actually be. I want to see it miss more bats like it used to back in college so that you can look at him as a guy who could stick in the back end of rotation. Catcher Leonardo Bernal, 2021 IFA and was in single A and struggled before he went on the IL in August. He's a switch hitter. Batted 265, 381, 362. Three home runs, 19 extra base hits, 49 walks to 55 strikeouts, four or five on stolen bases. 64 games behind the plate, played some DH, didn't play any first base, but just seemed to struggle a little bit in his, in his time in single A. I don't know what it is. It feels like this system, you have uh, Pedro Pajes, you have... The long saga of Ivan Herrera, you now have Leonardo Bernal. I don't know what it is about this system and catchers, and I'm hoping that this is not an organizational failure, this is just a coincidence, but you've seen quite a few catchers come in and either back up a little bit or struggle to continue developing in this system, and I don't know why, and I'm really curious. I'm going to watch him this year, see what he does, probably in high A. Uh, Right-hand pitcher Ian Bedell. Really interesting kind of guy here. Had a 2-4-4 ERA in the lower minors last year. Fastball slider change guy, but predominantly fastball. Threw it more than 50% of the time. The slider is really good for both whiff and chase, and I really think he needs to use it more. The issue is he doesn't have the confidence in the changeup, so he struggles a little bit with the lefties, and he needs to get the changeup up a little bit more often so that he can throw the slider and guys can't just... Uh, ignore one and sit on the other, right? So need to see the changeup get a little better. The dart throws, I was really tempted to give outfielder Mike Antico. Uh, really good speed, like decent speed in defense. The power's just limited. And so he either, like, he's that guy where he's swinging for the fences. He gets a lot of fly balls, but he doesn't have the power for them to actually be home runs. So he needs to either gain some more power, which you're looking at a college guy, the physical development is not 100% done, but it's pretty close. Or you need to bring the launch angle down a bit and just focus more on line drives, playing defense, getting on base. And I don't know at this point how realistic something like that would be. The guy I'm going to actually go with was acquired in the Jack Flaherty trade, but it's right-hand pitcher Zach Showalter. 2022 11th rounder out of high school by the Orioles. In eight starts, 10 total games between rookie ball and A ball. 0-2 with a 230 ERA in 31 in the third innings. 42 strikeouts, 12.1 per nine, to 15 walks, 4.3 per nine, and one home run allowed, so 0.3. Another guy with a very low release point, below five feet. And so because of that, his fastballs, he throws both, both a four-seamer and a two-seamer. The four-seamer can play really well up in the zone despite only being... 92 to 93, right? Because the the vertical approach angle is practically flat. It's just a couple degrees off of flat. So it plays really well when he can spot it up in the zone. Two-seamer, obviously, you got to keep that down. But has a slider, has a changeup. Both of those are super raw. He is a prospect in every sense of the word, as in he has a lot of development left to do to become a piece. But all of the... All of the pieces, or all the parts are there. All of the tools are there. If you see a little bit, he's only 19 years old. 
you see a little bit more velocity development, you see a little more consistency with that slider and that changeup, and be better able to uh, keep the tunnel with multiple pitches, but have the slider work, the two-seamer work down and the four-seamer work up. Zach Showalter's ceiling could be middle of the rotation. I really like him. He's just very young. Fantastic week this week. Very competitive division, so stay tuned. We've got the Pittsburgh Pirates next week, or tomorrow, and then after that, three more divisional contenders, so stay tuned. In the meantime, if you have questions about a guy that we missed, uh, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball, shows on Twitter at Locked on Farm. We're going to collect those for the Monday mailbag. Until next time, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. <laughs>